so, so the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to be discussing, I guess, uh, absorbing uh, uh, and reacting to Mac's uh, keynote, and also obviously welcoming uh, questions from the floor. But before we start, maybe Rich and Steve, you can just give us the 30-second overview on who you are and what you do, Rich. Thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, Rich Miller, I run a uh, consultancy and holding company called Telematica, but that has brought me to uh, serial offense uh, many times in Silicon Valley in startups, starting uh, much longer ago than I care to admit. Uh, but most recently, in starting with grid computing and moving into cloud, significant high performance compute, data grids and the like, moving more and more into automation of cloud infrastructure and now into big data and APIs. Um, most recently, I was the CEO of Streetlight Data and am now active in uh, a number of efforts on behalf of large customers in big data, data management, and also in infrastructure brokerage. Thank you. Steve. Sounds good. Um, uh, my business is defined by uh, Max slide nine, I think it was, uh, with the multiple different stacks that you had, Mike. Um, so um, I'm the CTO of Canopy Cloud. Uh, we're called the open cloud company. And the first people think when they see that is, it must be all open source, right? Well, what we really do is we open up clouds. I mean, if you look at the cloud business today, it's a fragmented, distributed, non-coherent platform, right? And if you think about people who want to really spend money and solve business problems, I'll give you an example that we've just done a, a, a solution with, um, should we call a British broadcasting company who did some recent um, Olympic kind of events. And how do they take advantage of cloud? How do they distribute media around the cloud? So we're helping them solve the problems, but when they look at the cloud market, they see proprietary, they see open source. If you talk to them about OpenStack, they're like, I don't want to hear about that, Steve. So we're trying to solve that problem with them, and that, that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Um, I meet a lot of passionate people like Rich and like Duncan. Um, and um, so we have, I, I, it was a great slide, Brad. it was slide nine. It had the different stacks, the different interfaces, the different technologies. How do you make sense of that? I mean, Simon Wardley, who's now um, a CSC, you know, he talks about how do we get this to commodity? It's a very challenging thing to do, right? So, um, so I spend all my time trying to work that problem out. Uh, when you're not tweeting. When I'm not tweeting, yes. no. So um, <laughs> sp speaking of which, I mean, yes, you made that point on Twitter very recently about you know, open is not open source. I mean, uh, let me start with, uh, you know, you've heard Mac's vision for, you know, next generation cloud platforms, plural. When you think of next generation cloud platforms, Rich, what's top of mind for you? Actually, what lives on top of them, and, and the first two slides of Mac's presentation absolutely hit it. First, APIs, but more than anything, the pragmatics of managing the APIs. In most cases, the companies I'm working with are both consumers of API for their raw material, and then the producers, the but publishers. Way, the world is full of bad APIs. I mean, let's, let's get that out straight away, right? Uh, there's <laughs> no doubt about it. And what that means is the pragmatics of, of API management often is to take into account the fact that the quality of some of the APIs you have are really Which, which low. I think, Matt, was the point you made, that you're only as good as your API, right? Exactly. That's right. And, you know, you know I hate to belittle uh, you know, keep belaboring the point around uh, what the Foursquare guy said, but, you know, someone that you don't know couldn't use your service if you had a crummy API, yeah, totally. right? And they wouldn't want to use your service because you wouldn't have a way of, of, of managing the life cycle around that. And they certainly couldn't extend what you did kind of as a core into a new service that you never, the original person never envisioned if they didn't have a solid, easy, consumable way. Because if somebody has to work really hard and has to have a lot of skill in order to use it, it's a bad API. But, but you know, Mark, I, th I think that's, that's one of the problems I, that's, I certainly see with certainly European customers is that giving up control. Right? Right. So we have, we have a lot of people that they want to control the whole IT experience. Mm -hmm. And that concept, you open the door, you expose an API, and you let someone do something with your technology that they don't know about. 
that's a very difficult thing for, I don't know if it's a cultural thing. Well, that's what I was saying before, you know, I, I, that's why I call it gene therapy. You alter the DNA, because in the therapy DNA, the, key word, right? the, the people that have control, you know, giving up and changing behavior, you know, uh, a lot of things are possible today on cloud that a lot of people don't think are possible. It's because the human behavior hasn't caught up to where the technology is. So, so continuing on the theme of APIs, I mean, you know, we've had APIs for years. I mean, I worked on something called FIX, Financial Information Exchange, many, many, many sure years ago. Age, yeah, I know. Um, but, I mean, what would you say about APIs and scale? Because, you know, a lot of times we talk, people talk about self-service. To me, self-service seems anachronistic um, if one's trying to build platforms at scale. Steve? So, um, so good, good topic, right? So I was on the phone with George Reese of Instratius last mm -hmm. night. I mean, for me, he's the king of APIs, right? I mean, he's been through all the wars of connecting things together. Uh, we talked about um, three particular things about APIs. One was the security of them. Mm -hmm. One was um, there are so many of them. Mm -hmm. And the third one's like how bad they are. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, and George, I, by the way, will always let you know how bad your API is. He's I mean, very passionate he's very, about them, right? He's very vocal. <laughs> he's very, very vocal. Um, but I think, you know, from, from a business point of view, it's, it, the APIs are great, but I, I just think, like, you know, especially in Europe, I mean, we, my company covers North America, Europe, and Asia. And I see three different attitudes to that whole cloud piece, right? In North America, I think they, uh, if there's any Americans here, I apologize, but they seem to be very malleable to the future. Well, like Mac and Rich, for example. <laughs> uh. The Europeans are much less malleable to the future. Um, so, so, for example, you know, we, we do uh, software as a service, we offer different applications. Mm -hmm. We do this thing called Canopy Compose, which lets you create application blueprints and wrap, wrap them around with APIs. And it's, it's too new for a lot of companies, right? So quite when you say compose, I mean, are you, are you saying that you can create sort of a catalog of these things? And yeah, so there's, there's three bits. I mean, you can pick things off a shelf, mm -hmm. you know, web server, you know, everyone else, everyone's doing that, right? right? Then we can give you some opportunities to blend your own mm -hmm. and then write your own completely. You know, if, if you're a really hip developer guy, we'll give you all these tools to do it. I don't see many of those guys in business willing to spend money right now. So I if I'm maybe doing, Max sees a different... So, so if I'm doing that, um, then... Uh, am I tied into your view of cloud, or can I take that blueprint no, I, and run it on that, software? Or absolutely, I mean that's that's a that's a big tenet that we have that you should be able to distribute applications wherever you need, right? Mm -hmm. But then that brings up a different kind of cloud friction, right? Mm -hmm. So if you let somebody deploy applications and data wherever they want, the business leaders are like, oh, hang on a minute. So so you're going to let somebody deploy my CRM in North America because everybody's scared of America at the moment, aren't they? Um, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, oh, I, I need I need this running Germany. So how so do you help? So that sounds like APIs? an argument for governance. And I mean, Rich, I know that's a topic well, dear to your heart. The 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 second point that I was going to make was uh, Max centering on data, and again, it's the pragmatics of managing the data, knowing very clearly where data is, data lineage, um, data provenance, mm -hmm. keeping track of everything built around these great engines that are, you know, incredibly performant, but the, you know, the, the blocking and tackling of watching data as soon as it's gathered, managed all the way through its life cycle, this is incredibly important, and the platforms on which we build all these applications have to be extremely aware and cognizant of the unfortunate realities of jurisdictions, of mm -hmm. geographies, where data can and cannot reside, where it must and must not be um, processed, and in what form of you know secure what forms of security you have to apply to it. Right. If you don't have that incorporated into your platforms, mm -hmm. into your um, your offerings, you have basically engendered exactly that kind of insecurity and that kind of doubt that you've just mentioned. So if we have fungibility then, or if we aspire to fungibility and we have security, and so how do we square that circle, Mac? I mean, you know, because... Well, I think one of, one of the things that people often kind of get wrong with cloud is they think, okay, I've got to be willing to give up control. No, you have to be willing to manage what you make available and how you make it available. 
So you don't want to give up control, because if you give up control completely, then you have just the Wild West. You have no curation of data. Right. So as you're selling services, it becomes kind of a flea market. You know, kind of everything's kind of in there. Uh, um, but you want to be able to not control everything to a point where no one can get access and no one can innovate around it. So there's this balancing act of, of okay, how am I going to give up some control that makes sense? I'm a, it's a give-to-get model. If I give up this control by making this API available to this amount of data, because I think this data could be useful for a wide variety of services that I can't deliver myself, but perhaps the ecosystem could. So it's that balancing act that I think is important. We've got a give to get model for code, and it's started. We don't yet have a give to get model for data itself. Right. And to the degree that we actually can develop the moral equivalent of Git and GitHub for data with all of the aspects of forking, joining, and that kind of reuse, I think those are the kinds of things that really make a difference. See, we are starting to see data fall into that category. Some very, I mean, you think about you think about Foursquare, I mean, the data, locality, in terms of where is this mobile person at this particular point in time, that's a data source, okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, think, you know, they, they don't think in those terms, but mobility, locality, those things are data sources. That's information that someone else could use for a greater purpose. And we're starting to see, you know, kind of data repositories of different kinds of data which are foundational elements for you to build interesting, more collaborative, more innovative uh, services around that core asset. So we tend to be somewhat anthropomorphic and think that you know, 10 billion is a big number because that's the number of people and, and you know, we're all data sources and so on and so forth. But there's another, there's another kind of internet out there that everyone talks about, the internet of things, the internet of everything. Right. I mean, and a scale which you, you sort of postulated where you know, it's, it's, you know, it's orders of magnitude greater than that. Steve, does Canopy handle internet of everything? Um, no, not today, we don't. Um, I think um, the, the biggest scale of things that we do is around media, so we just built this new media cloud. Um, mm -hmm. And the scale of that is frightening. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think one of the messages that I, I think Mark's done really well today is you open Pandora's box and this thing is crazy, right? So one of the things we learned early on it's as soon as you do something cool and everybody wants it and you can't scale, either you're going to be a Google and spend 20, how many is it, 21 billion, 23 billion on infrastructure? We don't want to do that. So, that, <laughs> so, so when you say scale, what axes are we talking volume of data in the media or are we it, talking processing power? Or are we well, talking... it, it comes back to old tradition. I don't know how old the general age of the audience is here, but it comes back to a simple thing called a network, right? Mm -hmm. You try and send all this media stuff over the network and the, all this chatter, the different types of networks that you have. You know, I, I, one of our major investors at Canopy is, is, is Atos. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got a very traditional network. They're very, very good at doing things in a traditional way. You open the door to the new internet of things and media, and it's like, whoa, this is totally different. So, so for me, open, for example, and when we talk about cloud open, is how do you partner with the guys that are really good at that, which is the Googles, which is the Amazons, right? So you touched on that, I think, Mac, in terms of the, 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 the sort of the fiber overlay network. And I mean, just a plug for a company that uh, here in Europe doing that, Interroot. I've said there'll only ever be a European company unless they call themselves Interout. But you know, the, the point is that um, you know, it isn't just about clouds of compute. It's yeah. about how you wire those up. And I, I, you know, I get the sense from looking at software and talking to the engineers there that you know, if I want to, I can run a very secure, highly distributed global private cloud That's and right. never touch the internet unless I choose to. Yeah, so, you know, um, just taking a look at kind of internet of things, you know, if you don't have the right uh, type of uh, architecture in terms of how you do overlays and how you do automate, then you end up with the internet of some things, not the internet of things. <laughs> because you won't be able to scale it, you won't be able to adapt to the different geographies, you won't be able to uh, uh, ensure that people can get the information that they need uh, at the time that they need it. So this aspect of predictability, uh, I mean, if the network gets congested and all of a sudden it starts dropping packets, what happens? It resubmits re and it gets more congested, yeah. right? So you have, to have a, you have to have an approach that gives you the flexibility of doing things over the top and doing things in an overlay fashion. 
Uh, and so, you know, for those who are familiar with Akamai, this kind of, uh, kind of model has existed. The internet wouldn't have been the internet without this type of a overlay type of a, of a model where you do things over the top in a very automated fashion without being, you know, kind of bogged down in the physical network. And this aspect of the explosion of mobile and, and these embedded devices and these back-end cloud services that need to interact with those devices, if you don't have that same architectural model, you're not going to be very successful. So, Rich, we've talked right. about the asymmetric nature of, yeah. of, of, of data. And it's great that you mentioned Akamai as a, as a model. If you just looked at the topology, that's exactly the topology you want for the Internet of Things, except you've changed the polarity. That's right. more, exactly. more than anything, you're not talking about a data, a, a content distribution network. Right. You're talking about a data collection network. That's so right. So it's ra rather than CDN, we're talking about DCN. Right. And turning that around, turning that on its head, is no mean feat. It's not a, it's not an easy thing to do. And the kinds of things you have to consider: congestion, the fact that data has gravity, has weight, creates friction. And then all of the issues that you get into regarding the authentication and security of that remote spot from which you're getting data, right. it is a completely new set of problems that no one yet has addressed, but they have a number of the same design patterns right. on which we can depend. So that, that's a kind of neat segue into something else I wanted to talk to you all about, which was a point you raised around you know, extreme innovation misses the point if you're not also looking to optimize. So perhaps this is an example where one wants to optimize what we have rather than the somewhat hubristic, everything that's gone before is kind of meaningless, doesn't understand the problem, let's just toss it all in the bin. Um, so, I mean, I thought that was a really interesting point because we talk about hybrid and we're talking technically about hybrid. This was a hybrid notion of, you know, Steve, you know, combining optimization with innovation. I thought that was a really interesting point. Well, it feels, you remember that, that picture that I think Stephen Hawking drew in his brief history of time of how you, when you reach a singular, singularity, you get stretched. <laughs> um, it feels like that right now, right? So on, on the one hand, from where I'm sitting, you know, and we've got a, compared to IBM, a very small business, but you know, it's a $10 billion business. Mm -hmm. And we've got, I would say, 95% of people in the old world mm -hmm. and 5% in the new world. And you feel this stretching thing, right, mm -hmm. where um, they want to keep buying physical service, which, which is good, but now they want to do it as a service, <laughs> which is fair enough. Um, but then you have to like tie in all the billing, the OSS, the BSS, and all the stuff around it, and, um, and you just, it's just an, a massive amount of work to take someone from the old world to the new world. And then I, I think this audience is, is very key because, um, you know, I get accused of turning up and being the guy that talks about the cool stuff that doesn't make any sense, right, to, to some of these old European guys. Uh, and often there's usually an open source guy sat next to me and he said, we could do this, we could do this, we could do the other, we could do this other thing. And it's... I, I, there was a Twitter <laughs> storm recently about, you know, OpenStack is going to eat the world, kind of, which is nonsense because OpenStack is important and it's, and it's obviously well, so an innovator. Zero, zero VM, Zero VM's wiki page, I don't know if you saw it recently, mm -hmm. but it made my blood boil yesterday. Um, <laughs> there, was two, there, there was three and things I hated about it. you're a relaxed guy normally. Was, <laughs> very relaxed guy normally. There's three things I hate about it. The first one he said is it's open source, everything's brilliant, right? And I think that gives the open source community a bad name, right? Just mm -hmm. having that kind of myopic view. Um, the second thing it said was it's built for a class of it, hypervisors today are built for applications that don't exist anymore. And I have, I, have, I, have a, I have an issue with that because, you know, six out of seven dollars are spent on the old stuff and not the cloud stuff, okay, according to IDC. And the third thing it said it could aggregate many physical devices. And I'm like, well, what are you? What are you? What are you? Aggregate physical devices, is that a cool thing to do these days? I don't know. What do you think? Aggregate multiple devices? Yeah, aggregate multiple blades. Is, is that a cool thing to do these days? Why do I care if I'm an application? <laughs> I, that, that, I'm still angry no, by reading well, the wiki page. Well, <laughs> the, the whole point, I think, is you know, what I wanted is the use of a set of abstractions that Thank you. give yeah. me exactly yeah. what I want, what I need to play with, and those issues about which I shouldn't have to care and don't want to care. And, and that varies, and that abstraction varies, doesn't it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and, and to, just to kind of pull back the curtain inside of IBM, when I started the due diligence for software, you know, that was one of the things that was the most difficult inside of IBM selling the fact that software 
allowed you to have a bare metal cloud. Like, a bare yeah. metal cloud? You can't have a bare metal. That's not cloud. I'm like, wait a minute, what is cloud? You have elasticity, you have consumability, and you have a pay-as-you-go model, right? And as long as, you know, me as an application provider, uh, as a developer, if I have a simple API that I can use mm -hmm. that allows me to get to the compute, the storage, and the network services that I need, do I care how you deliver that to me? I shouldn't care. Right? I, I, Whether I, it's OpenStack, CloudStack, VMware, it doesn't matter. As long as it's the right elasticity, the right consumability characteristics, the right quality of experience, and the, and the right cost point, I don't care. As long as they can get it yeah. to you when you need That's it. That's right, exactly. I think one of the challenges that I see, though, is, I mean, I, I totally agree with that, but I still see people's buying patterns and people's understanding of technology. That's right. Human behavior into, is in the way. Ex <laughs> I mean, well, there, there was a re I think it was 451 Research who did, uh, did something recently, and they said the, the biggest barriers to cloud, 82% of people said they were non-technical. It was people, politics, budgets, and all the other stuff that you get, right? So, so of one of the cloud stacks that we, we've got, and I say cloud with double quotes around it, right? Because it's a little bit outsourcing, it's a little bit self-service. 70% um, of the distribution of that is physical servers. And so the first thing, when I became CTO, I said, why is it physical servers? I mean, didn't we solve this problem 10 years ago when I was at VMware, we solved that, right? And they were like, people feel more comfortable and they're willing to spend the money to buy a physical server. So instead of getting you know, 30 things and getting the API, they're just, it's just familiar to them. But, but I think, and I think Matt, that's the challenge ahead I, of us. I think the, the eye-opener for IBM around software was bare metal cloud, meaning you can have it on the same see, terms. I see and a I huge think, market for that. And I think what's fascinating is, and fortunately the person that wrote this, I've blanked, I can't remember who they were, for, which is probably good for them, but yeah, there was a, there was a big <laughs> blog post Oh my God, this bare metal cloud is brilliant. You get your own resources. It's like, Server holy in the moly, cloud. I've <laughs> never, and yeah, so obviously this person was born very late in the day because. <laughs> well, you know. I, think, I think we've gone from server huggers to cloud huggers now. I mean, that, that's, that's the other thing that's driving me crazy at the moment is people who are passionate about their stack. Mm. Now, you know, you know, Canopy, the name was picked for a reason, right? In that we see these stacks as leafs, right? We see Amazon as a leaf, we see Google as a leaf. We see OpenStack, we, we're part of the Open Nebula CERN thing. We've got our VMware pieces. Mm -hmm. We see them as a collection of leaves. And then when we talk to big companies, they're like, how do we make sense of this, Steve? How do I make it programmatic? How do I program that cloud of all these distributed leaves? That's a, that's a big problem. If we can solve that together, that would be really cool. Yeah. So we've got seven, thank you. We've got seven or eight minutes left. If people are, want to join the discussion, ask questions, there are mics at the back. So please you know, walk up to a mic and, and stick your hand up. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's keep the, the conversation going. So um, abstractions are great. Yeah, one can have too many of them, obviously. But you know, if we go back to a point you made about you know, data being, uh, being you know, the currency, the de facto currency of cloud, what is the lingua franca of cloud? You know, big, big question. But you know, how are we going to talk about cloud? Are we going to talk about apps? Are we going to talk about services? Are we going to talk about, you know, where is it going to be most effective to actually build out this canopy? You know. I have one answer. <laughs> okay, so, one is good. That's a so, so, so the one, the one thing that I found works is, um, and it's a non-technical answer, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, it's when you get someone comes into your office with a business proposition and you help them solve that by helping them compose applications from four different vendors, put it in an app store and help them consume any infrastructure stack, wherever it is. Uh, in, in our case, it was media cloud. That, for me, is cloud, right? So I, I think, you know, Mike's point about uh, the Foursquare guy, when you open up your API and someone's making stuff out of your stuff that you never even thought about, I think that's amazing, right? In, in my world, we have to help them do that. But I think, I think that, for me, cloud, that's you just help people do stuff. I think that's what it really is, if that's not too vague. So yeah, yeah, it's almost the definition of success. Mm -hmm. If you're creating a service, and you're the only one that's developing the service and the only one that's innovating around the service, mm -hmm. uh, sooner or later, someone with maybe not as good a service, but one that's more consumable, and people can add additional services around because you've done a good job on the API and managing that, uh, the sustainability of that. I mean, to, to Duncan's point around OpenStack, I mean, you know, we have this, this danger inside of IBM and other big companies that, you know, it's so hard to create momentum that once it starts, everybody kind of rallies around it, and then it's the answer to our world hunger and 
yeah. the national debt. Yeah. You know? uh, <laughs> but and I, th I think there's a tangible. I mean, to, to we do have a question, by the way. Okay, it's tool, a, it's just a very, very quick point. I think there's a tangible bit about this. When you run non-cloud operations, you know the old world where you set thresholds and you kind mm -hmm. of understand everything that runs on it. I think when you're really running a cloud, you suddenly let go, and you think, I don't know what's running on this thing. You have to you have to do new tools that understand what's normal. You know what I mean? You, that, you know yeah. when you're running a cloud, that and is you're the not point. running the cloud, right? Yeah. yeah. Hi, do you want to just say who you are? Um, Hi, I'm Colin Hicks from Edinburgh University, so kind of local. And this is actually kind of, I'm thinking smaller. I'm thinking about our university and about the, uh, not so much the cloud, but your point about APIs. Um, I think it's fair to say that our IT provision in Edinburgh University is kind of federated. There are quite a lot of um, small units doing their own things. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of been on a sort of personal quest to get people to put APIs into the services they build locally. Go on. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd love to have some ammunition to take back. Wow. Um, like it doesn't work unless you do this? Or something yeah, more well, forceful, like if you don't do this, you don't get a pay I'd rise? What I'd like or? to do is consume... So what's in it for, what's in it for them? I mean, that's the classic question, right? What's, if you, I'd if like to argue that what's in it for them is yeah. that I and other people who are not part of central IS could stitch together some of the services that they consume and build features that we're asking for ourselves rather than have them do it. Hmm. So when you say federated, I'll, I'll say fragmented, right? Yeah, fragmented could be a good right? word for it. Is there then. two, five, ten, or 8,000 different? Uh, is this a different problem? Right? Uh, so there's... I think they're Are we in, am I, am I being in the order of 10 or 15 different. <laughs> so okay. can you give us a concrete example of the sort of thing you'd like to do which you can't do today? That might help. Uh, what I'd like to do is offer, for instance, our, uh, the people in our school, which is engineering, mm -hmm. to um, take some of the... Um, We'd like to stitch together some of our local data and data that's held centrally. Um, so there's identity management information, for example, the university holds on people that is quite high level, but we've got some <coughs> quite a lot of local stuff that's um, that so we rich. store. Well, this, this well in a wheelhouse. couple thing. of things. Um, one of the big things you have to deal with is the sense of, is both the sense of safety or the, you know, both it's, the, the, real, the reality of safety and, and, and the impression of safety for the people and you know for the community that you have to sell this to, so you've got a, a number of issues re regarding uh, how do you manage the APIs, but more than that, more than that, how do you deal with um, everything from managing jurisdictions of where data can and can't live, and you're going to end up you know making the case that if I do it on the basis of a common set of exposed APIs. APIs that actually do, in fact, publish a great deal of information about themselves and what's behind them, that safety and that, that impression of safety, that feeling of safety is you can allow the constituents to build for themselves without endangering the whole. If there is a problem, you can localize the problem, and it will, it will always be contained. And I think you need to speak to your vice chancellor about how you monetize your APIs. I think that's so, a very important point. So the vice chancellor you know, at Edinburgh is a really interesting guy because um, he's actually in the vanguard of, uh, of massive online education. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think, I mean, I think you know, it's already happening. It may not be happening in your, in, in your part of the, the, the university. But there's, you know, if, if one can offer as Edinburgh you know, ca classes to the world, and, and then, then I think it ought to be possible to solve problems within the university as a whole. So yeah, and one of the things I think it's important to understand is, is um, going back to the change in behavior again, you, know, you don't have to have a way of accomplishing this kind of spontaneous innovation that's outside of the core where you can do 100% of the things that you need to do 100% of the time. It's like, if you can do 60% of the things 100% of the time, that's really, that's really powerful if you think about it. And so, so, you know, we used to have this mindset that we had to have everything completely polished and completely, you know, perfect before we mm -hmm. made it available, all right? Now, you want to make something available that's very easy and allow these pe people that 
you know, or outside of the core asset to do things, you know, 100% on their own or close to 100% on their own. But it doesn't have to be every single use case. It's not a sustainable model. So, so what you have to do is break it down into very consumable services that you want to make available 100% of the time and through a self-service kind of fashion. But it doesn't support 100% of the different use cases. It's so the art of API wait, design. I'm going to have to, so just wrapping that up, just swing by the tech cube. There's a bunch of interesting companies there that I'm sure would love to talk to you about your problem. We've got uh, less than a minute left. So I wanted each of you. Uh, Steve, starting with you, working our way to, to Mac, um, uh, who, who obviously did a fantastic keynote. To, you know, what's the one single takeaway? And I know it's a tough question that you'd like this audience, apart from you know, just, just coming up and talking to you afterwards. But what's the key takeaway in terms of where do you see the next I generation platforms going? The next generation platforms, I mean, I think you're either on the train or you're under it, right? I mean, I mean this thing is moving really, really quick. And I think if you want to be on the train, You've got to be application focused and you've got to work out how do I make things. That question was great. So from the APIs, how do I, sorry to be rude, but how do you make money out of it? I mean, that's, that's how do you make money out of the cloud? That's been on the train. Rich? Um, I'd have to agree. The, the point, though, is uh, making a decision at what layer of abstraction mm -hmm. you are you're either endangering or in enhancing your, your level of business. And this is where the art comes in. This is not, this is not yet science. It's not even yet uh, the craft of engineering. Mike, lost uh, I, think, I think the main thing is, you know, don't be afraid of trying something new, but you do it in a way that if it fails, it fails quickly, and it, you can recover sure. quickly from it, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that you can learn from it. That's uh, and so, you know, that adaptability, you have to plan for that, all right? You have to figure out a way, how can I gather information, how can I incorporate that learning into the next instantiation? And you don't want to spend a lot of time and a lot of energy up front. You want to get it out, get it out quickly, learn from it quickly. You either learn that it's massively more successful than you thought, or it's a miserable failure and you need to do something else. Both of those are very, very valuable to learn very quickly. This is a classic Silicon Valley fail fast. Yeah, so so absolutely. On, on that, I'd just like to thank everybody. We are out of time. Uh, so if you'd like to put your hands together and thank the panelists for what I hope was an interesting and engaging conversation. And then I think there's another keynote up next. Thank you, guys. Thank you.